On January 13, 2005, GMO Free Maui assembled a diverse panel of experts to educate the greater community on the issues created by agricultural biotechnology. Panel members represented expertise in the fields of education and agriculture, science and public health, farming, law and litigation, and citizen activism. They came to Maui to discuss GMOs, genetically modified organisms, and wide-ranging concerns over the practice of genetic engineering. Issues discussed included Hawaii's precarious dependence on food and energy imports, protection of Hawaii's agricultural export markets, local control and democracy, health and environment, and Hawaii's pivotal role in the national and international GMO debate. The powerful biotechnology industry spends millions of dollars each year to force acceptance of their controversial products. Using well-funded lobbyists and political clout, biotech corporations withhold vital information from regulatory agencies, legislators, and consumers. GMO Free Maui offers the following expert testimony as a source of objective information. That the companies at one point realized that there was dangers with the product and it took several years for them to actually acknowledge it. And of course we've seen this with Monsanto, uh, with Agent Orange, uh, with PCBs, products that for over 20 years they knew that they were devastating the entire community. These um, agricultural agreements are far more deadly than any cruise missile um, or even a war in Iraq. There's uh, about 30,000 people dying every day from hunger in the world, every single day, and that's as a direct result of um, economic policy around agriculture because we're actually producing enough to feed one and a half times the current world population. Incredible as it may seem today, we have now lost 90 5% of all vegetable and fruit varieties that were grown in the United States in 1900. A study by the EPA recently in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science revealed that contrary to previous reports, pollen from turf grass genetically engineered to resist Roundup traveled and cross-pollinated plants up to 13 miles away. These are essentially different from any other kind of seed. It challenges the notion of substantial equivalence, which is allowing our federal agencies to push these things down our throats. When the thing you're about to release is potentially irreversible, like Paul said, this is a live form. If you release DDT and you learn you made a mistake, well, you stop it. If you release PCBs, you can stop it. If you release a drug, you recall it. This thing is live. Luke Anderson has worked with environmental, social justice, and farming groups around the world as an advisor on genetic engineering and related issues since 1997. His best-selling book, Genetic Engineering, Food and Our Environment, has been published in three languages. Let's start with defining what we're talking about. The industry likes to suggest that, you know, what's the big deal? We've been genetically modifying plants and animals for thousands of years. That's the argument we hear again and again. We see it in editorials, we see it in op-ed pieces in the newspapers and so on. And of course we've been changing the genes of plants and animals, but that's been done within, broadly speaking, the limits set by the processes of sexual reproduction. You can get a rabbit to cross with a different kind of rabbit to get a new variety, but you do not usually find rabbits having sex with uh, potatoes or bananas, which is, which is exactly what genetic engineering does allow molecular biologists to do. That is, take DNA from any organism and engineer it into another organism in order to try to reproduce a desired characteristic. Um, examples include taking uh, genes from jellyfish that make them glow and engineering them into pigs so that their snouts glow under ultraviolet light. Or um, taking, taking genes from humans and engineering, engineering them into corn plants so that the corn plants contain a rare class of human antibodies that attack sperm. The idea being that these corn plants could be used as some kind of plant gel contraceptive. Now these are all examples of things that are being done. We are now witnessing the genetic engineering of plants, animals, trees, fish, insects, well pretty much everything you can think about. 
The companies that stand to profit most from the introduction of genetically engineered crops are the ones who decide whether or not they're safe. And at the beginning, they said that this problem of contamination, you know, the, the spreading of pollen from genetically engineered crops or <clears throat> the escape of genetically engineered animals to contaminate um, the environment, you know, all of these things, they said, well, this is just never going to happen. Well, well, now, of course, we know that it does happen. And so what the FDA is now doing is the White House gave a directive to the FDA saying, well, what we need to do, see now is laws passed that make this contamination acceptable. First of all, they said it wouldn't happen. Now they said it does happen, so we need to make it legal and acceptable. So the FDA is looking at regulations that would allow the corporations to just give a little bit of information to the agencies about these experimental field trials they're doing, because at the moment they can keep most of the information commercially confidential, give, give a little bit of information and that way, way they would get out of any liability associated with human health problems or environmental problems uh, coming from these uh, uh, field experiments. A member of the audience asks Luke to explain the circumstances that led to the U.S. Patent Office overriding its previous policy that prohibited the patenting of life. In 1980, a guy called Chakrabarti, who was an employee of General Electric, um, got the right to patent a genetically engineered bacteria as his own invention. He was stunned. He said, all I did is shuffle around a few genes. Um, but basically what this patent ruling, and it was a close ruling, five to four, did is it paved the way for the patenting of DNA um, from plants, from animals, from humans, and so on. And, and, the, and the patent office basically has granted um, patents, as I mentioned, about 1,000 of the 20,000 or so human genes already patented, uh, patents existing for animals, for plants, and so on. And there has been uh, a big problem with the fact that the patent office has just been granting these, but then it's been exacerbated by the fact that laws got passed through the World Trade Organization, actually making it a requirement that countries that are signatories to the World Trade Organization respect a corporate patent if it's awarded in the United States so that it also applies to Thailand. And with respect to indigenous peoples, this is one of the real um, hot potatoes because um, one of the things that they hold is the knowledge, um, traditional knowledge of how to use plants and animals for amongst other things, medicinal purposes. And these very uses are being stolen from indigenous peoples and, and, and patented by pharmaceutical companies. Not only that, the genes of indigenous peoples are being patented by pharmaceutical companies. A, a company with a patent on the entire gene pool of the people of Tonga uh, um, and, and, and many other examples similar to that. And, and I've even heard speak in, in certain circles, well, it doesn't really matter if if you know, certain species are wiped out or if, if we lose these indigenous peoples, as long as we've got their genes in a gene bank, we'll have anything of use that they might have offered to us. And so this is a, a very real problem. Dr. Hector Valenzuela has worked at the University of Hawaii's Manoa College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources for the past 14 years as the statewide Vegetable Crops Extension Specialist. He has authored over 300 publications focused on crop ecology and is a staunch proponent of sustainable and organic farming in Hawaii. Uh, over the past few years, I have voiced my concerns about the poorly regulated field testing and release of biotechnology crops in Hawaii. Uh, important issues that I have raised emphasize the many unknowns about crop biotechnology, such as what are the long-term effects from their introduction on human health or on the environment. This, this data, from my point of view, is still lacking. And in con concerning the GMO papaya, I think that data is lacking as well. I have asked for it, and I have not yet seen it. So overall, I'm afraid that, we have, that we're committing the same mistakes that we have committed in the past, uh, applying chemicals that we didn't understand well, <clears throat> or introducing insect species or plant species that we introduced in the past, thinking that they were beneficial, to find out years later that they devastated a lot of our, our native ecological habitats. So overall, I, I'm concerned that uh, the University of Hawaii has the wrong focus on promoting genetic engineering and that it is steering Hawaii agriculture uh, in the wrong direction. 
and in, in, that instead it should be promoting more sustainable practices that help uh, to develop information that is actually useful for our growers. Uh, one of the main concerns that I have is the poor regulatory framework for biotechnology crops. And over the past few years, and lately, the past few months, almost daily, you see headlines showing the poor regulatory uh, area in the United States with regards to several other industries. And just to give you a couple of headlines uh, from Nature, uh, which is a major science paper, uh, university industrial complex, out of control, from, from a newspaper from Canada, Americans as guinea pigs, that's what the editor indicates, uh, from Nature again, Biox suppressed study indicating that the companies at one point realized that there was dangers with the product and it took several years for them to actually acknowledge it. And of course, we've seen this with Monsanto, uh, with Agent Orange, uh, with PCBs, products that for over 20 years they knew that they were devastating entire communities. They, they, they had the information and they did not release it because they, were, they had a virtual monopoly on the products they were selling, which is exactly what's going on today with uh, biotechnology. In the 1970s, uh, the state passed a constitutional amendment uh, that the agricultural lands should be preserved in the state. Uh, it, should al it also indicated that Hawaii should strive for self-sufficiency. Why, why did we turn into biotechnology? Uh, I, call, I call it the uh, corporate approach to research where we, we just think about getting grants and getting monies. Administrators think on five-year periods how much performance shows in their resumes after five years. And I also talk about the group thinking uh, approach, uh, and you can compare it with the real estate bubble in Japan or with the high tech bubble. So everybody jumped into the, into the biotech bandwagon in Hawaii and nationally, and just because everybody doing it doesn't necessarily mean that, it, that it's right. Uh, this was also a, an echo of Governor Cayetano's call to, ha to make Hawaii a biotechnology center. In essence, biotechnology became a center point for, for the college. And just to give you an example, <clears throat> in 1996, there was a, a CITAR, a college report by administrators of what they, were been do they had been doing. They mentioned biotechnology six times, organic agriculture zero times, and sustainable ag one time. The plan of work of the college for the year 2000, from 2000 to 2004, it mentioned genetic engineering 36 times, organic farming zero times, and sustainable ag seven times. Uh, however, sustainable ag is used in a generic form where even people doing pesticide work call their work sustainable. And right now we're importing a lot of the food, and basically what we're doing is just buying a lot of oil for, for transporting it. Right now we're, prom we're promoting uh, industrial agriculture, which is, based, which is based largely on energy, on fertilizers, on energy to produce the pesticides and so on. And GMOs is part of the same mentality. Uh, you need more pesticides, you need more products, more fertilizers. And this is especially critical in Hawaii. My vision for Hawaii, and I think it's a, a, a credible one, is for Hawaii to be known internationally as an ecological state, as a leader in uh, organic agriculture. And this would fit really well with the tourism industry from Japan, from Europe, from Western United States and Canada, where it's an environmental uh, community. Uh, we could be a center for agriculture, for organic research, where we can bring researchers from all over the world and have Hawaii to be recognized as an organic and ecological state and not one that works more on the side with corporations. Thank you. Paul Achitoff is a graduate of Harvard College and Columbia Law School. He is the managing attorney of the Hawaii Office of the national nonprofit environmental law firm, Earth Justice. Mr. Achitoff filed a lawsuit against the U.S. Department of Agriculture for failing to comply with federal environmental laws before authorizing field tests in Hawaii of food crops genetically engineered to produce drugs and industrial chemicals. Now, biopharmaceuticals have been generated in fermentation tanks in contained facilities for over 22 years, resulting in over 100 FDA-approved commercialized products, including insulin. So it is not as though you cannot do this kind of work without uh, growing them in open fields. 
in about 14 or 15 years of biofarm field tests using these crops, uh, there has not been a single FDA approved product. None has been approved for human consumption. Now, ingestion or inhalation, even at very low levels of some of the uh, parts of these crops, could cause severe health consequences. Uh, these include oral tolerance, in other words, the disabling rather than strengthening of the immune system, allergic reactions of various levels of seriousness, and autoimmune disorders where, of course, the body's immune system attacks itself. Prodigine, one of these corporations that does this kind of work, tested in Hawaii corn engineered to produce an experimental AIDS vaccine, which consists of an artificial version of glycoprotein GP120, which is found on the ape version of HIV. Ingestion or inhalation of minuscule amounts of GP120 could induce tolerance and thus disable the immune systems against HIV infection with potentially lethal consequences. Or it could lead to more virulent strains of HIV. Similar considerations apply to the experimental vaccines for hepatitis B and swine diarrhea, which are produced in the field tests. Prodigine also has tested uh, crops engineered to produce a protonin, which is a blood clotting protein derived from cows. A protonin is a known allergen that can cause anaphylactic shock. It also belongs to a class of proteins known as trypsin inhibitors that have been shown in animal experiments to cause pancreatic disease, sometimes leading to cancer. So an obvious question is, can biofarm crops get into our food supply? Now these experiments are done in open fields and they are done in fields that are uh, not disclosed, the locations are not disclosed to the public. In fact, uh, it is essentially so far impossible for anybody in this room to find out where these tests are being done. Could be half a mile away, could be near a school, could be near uh, a conventional crop, could be near uh, a, uh, well, it could be near anything. In late 2002, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS, which is part of the USDA, ordered the destruction of a half a million bushels, or about $3 million worth, of soybeans in Nebraska, which were contaminated by protogene corn that was engineered to produce a pig diarrhea vaccine. And then later that same year, APHIS ordered the incineration of 155 acres of corn in Iowa over concern that protogene biofarm corn pollen may have drifted onto the field. So these are two examples of situations where it was on the verge of getting into the food supply, but apparently was caught before it did. Of course, we don't know what may have slipped through the cracks. In 2002, the National Academy of Science issued a study recognizing the hazards of gene escape through seed dispersal, gene transfer, and pollen dispersal, and specifically noted the danger of biopharmaceutical plants contaminating conventional food crops, quote, with the unanticipated results of novel chemicals in the human food supply. Biopharmaceutical plants can cross with both wild and cultivated relatives, thereby producing contaminated hybrids. Biopharm experiments, as I've said, are very often done in corn, and Hawaii has about a $50 million a year seed corn industry. Consider what the, the impacts would be of cross-pollination or contamination of seed corn, which is grown in Hawaii and shipped to countries around the world if it, if it happens to contain one of these pharmaceuticals or industrial chemicals. A study by the EPA recently in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science revealed that contrary to previous reports, pollen from turf grass genetically engineered to resist Roundup traveled and cross-pollinated plants up to 13 miles away. And contamination appeared not only in the non-GE test plants, but also wild plants of the same and different species. Now in Hawaii, Hark plants at least some experimental crops, and I don't know 
for a fact whether they include the biofarm crops that, that Hark does grow, but they grow experimental crops in central Oahu bordering Waipahu in an area surrounded by residential neighborhoods and conventional agricultural crops as well as the Nature Conservancy's Honouliuli Preserve, which is home to nearly 70 rare and endangered plants and animal species, some found nowhere else on Earth. Are they growing or have they grown biofarm sugarcane there? I don't know. They won't say. The escape of volunteers or plants grown from seeds left in the environment after harvesting, it's simply not possible to account for every viable seed every season. This is how Prodigene's biofarm corn contaminated the soybeans in Nebraska. Genetic material can spread not only by the elements, wind and rain, but birds, animals, and even humans, where these tests are conducted as they are outdoors, accessible to the public, and not identified to anyone, even the workers in the fields. And unlike a molecule of a toxic chemical, a biopharmaceutical gene has the opportunity to multiply itself repeatedly through reproduction, which can frustrate attempts at containment. In other words, corporations are releasing into the environment not just a toxic chemical, but a living organism bearing and reproducing the chemical. These organisms grow and can pollinate other plants, which in turn pollinate other plants ad infinitum. The corporations themselves have acknowledged over a hundred known infractions of their GE field test permit conditions and regulations. That was four years ago, and those were just the acknowledged known infractions. The EPA has cited several permit violations in Hawaii in the last couple of years. Earlier this year, the Union of Concerned Scientists published a report entitled Gone to Seed, which reported current regulatory regimes are incapable of preventing contamination. In other words, the same seed, corn, soybeans, and canola being used by the large growers throughout the United States are contaminated with genetically engineered uh, seed. So it's in there and it is being planted and replanted all the time. Thanks. On February 4, 2005, the U.S. Department of Agriculture was forced by court order to take the first step toward public disclosure of biopharmaceutical test sites in Hawaii. Representatives of the USDA handed over documents specifying the precise locations of open-air field tests of biopharmaceutical crops to Paul Achitoff. Although this information is still unavailable to the public, this was the first time the federal government has been forced to disclose the location of field tests of genetically engineered crops. Dr. Lauren Pang is a specialist in the field of public health. He graduated with honors from Princeton University with a degree in chemistry and attended medical school at Tulane University where he also earned a master's degree in public health. Dr. Pang earned medals for achievement, research and development, and meritorious service as a lieutenant colonel for the U.S. Army Medical Corps at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. He has served as an advisor to the World Health Organization for over 20 years. The medical people follow what we call the precautionary principle. A new product, a drug, vaccine, food additive, and these things, we assume them to be ineffective and toxic to proven otherwise. Under that principle, the health people, there's a whole bunch of different regulatory practices. And under the environmental side, you have environmental impact statement, environmental assessment, because we assume they're dangerous to proven safe. Okay, so let's talk about why we behave, why we use the precautionary principle and when we should use it. I was actually shocked. Some of the industry people said, well, we don't use that. Well, everybody else does. Food, you know, food, additive drugs, vaccines, and all. And when should you use it? Three big points here. The FDA did a study to show that why so many of these drugs, Vioxx, ephedrine, had to be recalled because there was conflict of interest. So when you have conflict of interest, you perk up and say, well, where's that precautionary principle? Next, when the thing you're about to release is potentially irreversible, like Paul said, 
This is a live form. If you release DDT and you learn you made a mistake, well, you stop it. If you release PCBs, you can stop it. You release a drug, you recall it. This thing is live. So you surely want to bring out more precaution. And finally, if I have a disease, I took the drug. He didn't have the disease, he didn't take the drug. But you hear it from the previous speaker, this stuff is on the wind. When it's ubiquitous, like secondhand smoke, water additives, then people don't have a choice not to take it. Getting back to health, you know, we have all these regulations and different sets of tests. Got to clear the lab, got to clear animals, got to clear all these different human steps. One of the human steps is called phase one. You literally take volunteers, about 15 of them, you give them high doses, long doses of these products, and you monitor them, and you say, look, this is the thing abnormal. So this is what they call the indicator organ. When we see this turn, it tells you other stuff is coming. Once you figure out that, then you do larger studies, hundreds of patients, to look for statistical certainty. One other thing which we had to add on was called phase four human studies. When the stuff is sold, like Vioxx, well, it's sold, it cleared all this other stuff, well, we watch. And when people have heart attacks, we piece it together. We say, hey, you with a heart attack, you without the heart attack, what'd you take? Vioxx, what'd you take? Nothing. You can only do that if the thing is labeled. Now, where is all this regulatory safety stuff? Well, I met with Monsanto. They don't have the data. They just don't have the data. Okay, fine. And if you say, why don't you have the data? Well, the regulatory agencies don't require it. So you write to the regulatory agencies and say, where is your data? They said, we are the regulatory agency. We regulate. Wrong. The scientists always ask the regulatory agency, show me the data, then I will believe you. At this stage, there is no data. So obviously, you know, there's nothing to look at. That's problem number one. Where is your data? Problem number two, are you setting up for phase four post-marketing studies? Well, there's a publication by the National Academy of Science telling us, please label what you put out. And if you plant experimental crops, please tell us what you put out so we can piece together who got sick and who didn't and if they had the experimental exposure or not. This is by National Academy of Science put out, I think, five months ago. At this point, we have no evidence to say that it, that it is dangerous to consume food products that contain GMOs. Good. But at the same time, we also don't know its negative side. So we have to say that we do not know the adverse health effects of GMO foods. Gee. Well, if that's the case, you don't know if it's safe and you don't know it's harmful. Precautionary principle tells you, you assume it's harmful to prove and otherwise. When you put the gene in somebody, it's the person that's complicated. You don't know how it behaves. It's going into the genome. The genome, your whole DNA, is real complicated. We just learned about that. And it's surely going into the environment. They showed that the GE modified products are potentially more risky than standard products. So they're already telling you the unintended health effects are greater than standard methods. So you can forget about the argument of bioequivalence. This is not equivalent. National Academy of Science. Thank you. The FDA's incorrect assumption of bioequivalence, also known as substantial equivalence, has exempted GE foods from long-term safety or toxicology testing. Amy Schollenberger is the policy director for the organization Rural Vermont. She is responsible for strategic planning and campaign development, as well as policy agenda. She has served as a senior policy analyst for Public Citizen's Critical Mass Energy and Environment Program. She sits on the boards of the Smart Memes Strategy and Training Project and the Citizens Awareness Network. On April 26th of 2004, our governor signed into law the first in the nation um, legislation to require the labeling of genetically engineered seeds that are sold in our state. Yeah. And that, that law went into effect on October 1st, 2004. But not only did it require labeling of seeds, the most important thing about our bill is that it put a definition of genetically engineered seeds and plant parts into our state statute, which says these are essentially different from any other kind of seed. 
It challenges the notion of substantial equivalence, which is allowing our federal agencies to push these things down our throats. The industry was so opposed to that definition that they, they you, you should have seen the tactics they were using to, to stop that bill. Um, the third thing that it requires that's a little, it's not so known outside of Vermont, but the third thing that it requires is that the manufacturers of the seeds must report every year to the state how many genetically engineered seeds are sold in our state. But this year, on Tuesday of next week, will be the first year that our secretary reports based on mandatory reporting. So we know the numbers are, are accurate. They're not just whatever the industry decides to give us. Um, so that bill was really groundbreaking and exciting for us. But this year, the bill that we're pushing, we call the Farmer Protection Act. And it's about putting the liability for these seeds and crops right on the manufacturer. So anything that happens, whether it's a crop that gets contaminated and someone loses their organic certification, God forbid, or whether it's someone getting sick 20 years from now, or whether it's, you know, um, allergies or anything like that, it will go right back to the manufacturer. And the really important thing that I want to say about what's happening in Vermont is that it's all led by farmers. It, it's not a consumer-driven campaign. It's a farmer-led campaign. And so the issues that we're dealing with are about the farmers having control of their seeds because it's really the most basic thing if the corporations have control of our seeds, we're really in trouble. The farmers know how to, how to cultivate seeds and how to steward the land, and the corporations not only don't know, but they don't care. And so we want to put the control into our farmers' hands rather than into the corporations' hands. So this bill would put strict liability on the corporations. It would provide protection for contracts. Um, for the farmers so they can get only sued in Vermont, not in Missouri, where the laws favor the corporations. And it protects them also against patent infringement violations. So we're very excited about what's happening in Vermont, but also what's happening across the U.S. Two other states in New England are starting town-to-town -to -town campaigns in Maine and Massachusetts. People are gearing up to get town resolutions passed, um, like the ones we had in Vermont a few years ago. In the Northern Plains, liability legislation has been introduced in both Montana and North Dakota this year, and their campaigns are paralleling ours. And in California, already three counties have banned GMOs, and a half dozen more are lined up to, to try to do the same thing at county-level legislation. So all across the United States, this is happening. And, and here in Hawaii, it's very important for you to stand up to the corporations because you're on the front lines here. You know, these biofarm crops are, are the scariest thing ever. And it's really important to know that you're not by yourself, even though you're on an island. GMO-free citizen initiatives have prompted biotech interests to introduce bills in 16 states to prevent local governments from creating GMO-free zones. Nancy Redfeather is a teacher and Kona coffee farmer developing an experimental educational farm on the island of Hawaii. She is also a director of the Hawaii Genetic Engineering Action Network. She has spent many years growing, selecting, and saving all types of vegetable seeds which grow well in tropical climates. Nancy is the founder of the Hawaii Island Seed Exchange and co-founder of Biodynamics Hawaii and the Know Your Farmer Alliance. I must say it took me a while to get involved in this issue because I kind of stood on the edge for a while until I found out that Hawaii was the center for world testing of food, feed, and biopharmaceutical crops. Thousands and thousands of tests have been done here on tens of thousands of acres with one person overseeing the oversight at the Department of Agriculture Plant Quarantine. Our food is, um, is very important to us. Food is different from other consumer products. It is something that we literally take inside ourselves. It's necessary for our growth and our life and is bound up with our culture and our traditions, and so we care about it intensely. We actually have a fundamental right to know what it is that we are eating and that the food that we are eating is safe. 
Today in Hawaii, we import 90 to 95 percent of all of the food that we eat. We even import 25 percent of our bananas, 65 percent of our avocados, lemons and limes, and 86 percent of our taro. In 1930, Hawaii was completely 100% food self-sufficient, and we were exporting. What we were exporting at that time was wheat from Makawao. Makawao was growing all of the wheat that was being sent to Honolulu and milled into flour, which was providing the wheat flour for all the peoples in the Hawaiian Islands. So it's possible for us to be food self-sufficient today. It seems like in today's uncertain political world and certainly the wacky world weather that we're seeing, it would just make sense to develop a local food security and support small family farms. But will genetic engineering support this vision? <laughs> Scientists and laboratories are now making decisions for the farmer. Many of these people, and I know them personally, they have never, ever even been in a field. For the past 10,000 years, agricultural research has been conducted by farmers and by plants people who had a love of the natural world and were working with plants in a partnership. I find it very disturbing that the, um, the Hawaii State Legislature the Department of Agriculture, the University of Hawaii, and Manoa, and the federal government, they have all created this very cozy partnership with the largest chemical companies on the earth who now call themselves life science companies to direct the future of agriculture away from local, sustainable, eco-healthy farming systems which benefit local economies, the farmer and his family, the land, the discriminating consumer, and the biodiverse ecosystem of the Hawaiian Islands. It is ironic and short-sighted to have a state with the most fragile ecosystem, the most endangered plants and animals in the United States, and the most field trials of new experimental, untested, unregulated, new combinations of genes in food and feed. After all, if the new agricultural biotech crops were really safe and effective, then why would the industry out there be working so hard, and indeed they do, to keep their critics cowed and the public uninformed? Incredible as it may seem today, we have now lost 95% of all vegetable and fruit varieties that were grown in the United States in 1900. Why is that important? because the health of agriculture actually rests on biodiversity of species and the monocultures of cloned crops, cloned from a single cell of a genetic engineering event who rely heavily on chemical inputs will do nothing for us to improve the health of our agriculture. Seed holds the future of civilization on planet Earth. Seed is the living source of life on Earth and without it we would perish. He or she who controls the seed, controls the food, controls the people. Open pollinated seed has an uncanny and mysterious ability to take the environment into itself and adjust its own gene expression and improve the next generation's ability to resist disease and pests survive in harsh and unpredictable conditions of changing weather patterns. I see this in my farm all the time. Seed is extremely intelligent. Farmers worldwide are now being told that they will be left behind if they do not use genetically engineered seed. But I personally see nothing yet that has come out of the genetic engineering seed industry. Either they're resistant to Roundup or they have a pesticide in every cell that's what we have so far, that cannot be accomplished faster um, and economically and better with traditional breeding and selection programs. It is not faster, it is not cheaper to produce genetically engineered crops. If the University of Hawaii at Manoa were to invest the same research dollars in Dr. Valenzuela's organic sustainable research program, Hawaii would be the world leader in tropical agricultural systems. 
Because of our isolation, we could also be the world's seed bank for organic and tropical agriculture. Locally on the island of Hawaii, UH and their GMO papaya partners have invested millions of dollars and 10 to 15 years of research to develop the GMO papaya. According to the Hawaii Department of Agriculture statistics, 37% of the papaya farms have closed since the introduction of the GMO papaya in Puna in 1998. The price per pound on the papaya has dropped 50% to the farmer and its world markets have closed. These are not flattering statistics. Last July, GMO Free Hawaii sent samples from backyard and certified organic farmers to Genetic ID, a well-known and respected laboratory in Iowa for PCR testing. The results were 53% contamination on the Big Island. No one knows for sure anymore whether a papaya seed is transgenic or not. When you test the papaya seed, you destroy it. The National Organic Standards Board of the USDA has sold out the U.S. papaya farmers when they made the ruling that organic papayas could contain GMO seeds and still be called organic. This ruling found in the preamble section says that papayas can be sold as organic if the farmer has made every effort to, control, to control cross-pollination. Now, what sort of farming techniques would that include? How can farmers control wind, bees, bird, insects, moving pollen? Why is the burden placed on the organic farmer to prove that they have taken every effort to control contamination? It seems only logical that the producer of the GMO seed should be the one who assumes responsibility for genetic trespass. These sorts of laws have just passed in Germany. I farm coffee in Kona. Gourmet Kona coffee is a world-renowned product that has been grown in Hawaii for 176 years. The coffee industry statewide looked at the plight of the GMO papaya farmer, talked with the National Specialty Coffee Association and among themselves, and they created a resolution last year asking the state of Hawaii to protect coffee and not allow any field testing or any planting of any genetically engineered coffees in the Hawaiian Islands. It was an economic decision, and it was the first time that an entire industry has come to consensus. Since then, I have been told by one of the main um, researchers at UH that, um, that you went to the dean and told him that he was stopping his research on genetically engineered coffee because if the entire industry didn't want it, he was wasting his time and the University of Hawaii's money to do it. I want to say one more thing um, because it's about Maui. On Maui, the innovative Maui Land and Pineapple Company and their CEO David Cole are quickly becoming agricultural leaders in the state. They are developing a GMO-free, ecologically and sustainable farming system which will produce a quality product for the discriminating customer. And I hope all the people on Maui will continue to support um, this company and um, and their leadership to move in this direction because that was a very, very courageous step that he took. Thank you. Nancy responds to a question about laboratory techniques used to create GMOs. You can shoot a gene gun that has little pellets of tungsten and gold coated with the DNA sequence that you want to put into the cell and most of the cells die. You also insert an um, antibiotic resistant marker so that you can then douse them all with antibiotics and the ones that don't die then have taken up the sequence. So actually sometimes it can be a single cell that, that then everything is cloned from that creates the seed, which is totally the opposite of diversity. Absolutely, it couldn't be further from diversity. And these particular seeds need particular inputs. They need chemicals in order to grow and those chemicals are all oil-based. All chemical fertilizers are oil-based. It's a treadmill that goes on and on. The liability issue is key. We had this bill last year in our Senate 
And they brought this guy up from Washington who was their big wig corporate lawyer lobbyist to talk about the legislation. And the senators asked him, you tell us why we shouldn't pass this bill here. And the best answer that lobbyist could give is, if you pass this bill in this state, we will never sell genetically engineered seed in this state again because we cannot take the liability. A lot of the power that is currently held by corporations right now is dependent upon keeping the public ignorant. Some people have also brought the, the idea of uh, bringing up the Nuremberg Code, uh, that which says that uh, people are not to be used as experimental units without their knowledge. I read yesterday it said there were seven million um, patents waiting at the offices to be approved um, so that the corporations would own different crops, different um, uh, genes, different plants, different whatever, seven million in the European Union, the United States and Japan. The more the public knows, the harder it will be for the industry to survive. Uh, we're very susceptible. Uh, right now we have uh, like an eight-day supply of food. They are struggling mightily uh, to pursue their plans while keeping people in the dark. As a Kanaka Maoli, the songs of our people, they talk about the relationship um, of nature, of nature and man, nature and God. It hurts my heart to see and think that that can be destroyed. I look at these genetic modified organisms as part of that genocide. I see it as not only in terms of the environment, but our people with the relationship that we have with the Kalo, that is our brother. What they're growing, where they're growing it, uh, what the health effects are, it's all a pyramid based upon keeping the public ignorant. Can you honestly look in the eyes of your kikis or your mo'opunas, your grandchildren, and secure their future with what is coming around the corner? Your land is at risk and there's nothing more important than our land. I'd just like to close um, with a little excerpt from uh, Terry Tempest Williams' book called Wild Mercy. The eyes of the future are looking back at us, and they are praying for us to see beyond our time. They are kneeling with clasped hands that we might act with restraint, leaving room for the life that is destined to come. GMO Free Hawaii is a coalition of grassroots organizations working to move Hawaii's agriculture away from genetic engineering and toward locally based sustainable agriculture. GMO Free Hawaii is on the front lines defending the integrity of the world's food supply. Your participation is vitally needed. Lama, 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 lama.